Hello, everyone. I'm Daniel Diermeyer. I'm the Dean of the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. And on behalf of Harris and of Arts and Public Life, an initiative of UChicago Chicago Arts, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our event this evening. We have gathered some very special guests together tonight to delve into the important role cultural policy and the arts can play in developing more vibrant, equitable cities. They are also here to help us celebrate an exciting new chapter in the Harrow School's longstanding commitment to cultural policy leadership. I am delighted to announce a new partnership between the Harrow School and Arts and Public Life that will advance our shared commitment to the future of cultural policy. The partnership will merge Arts and Public Life's Place Lab with the Harrow School's Cultural Policy Center under the Place Lab name. It will be uniquely positioned to be a catalyst for new arts and culture-based approaches to urban development in the United States and around the world. Led by Theasta Gates, Professor of Visual Arts and Director of Arts and Pi Pi Public Life, the new entity will unite the current Place Lab's innovative place-based arts practices with the Harrow School's dedication to cultural policy and rigorous evidence-based analysis. Together, Place Lab and the Harris School can spur thoughtful change in the cultural policy space through creative projects, rigorous evaluation, partnership with artists and policymakers, and by training the next generation of policy leaders. The University of Chicago believes that arts and culture can play an essential role in urban transformation. Through scholarship and action, arts and public life, Place Lab and the Cultural Policy Center have led the university in exploring the impact of arts, culture, and policy on society. This merger enables the Harrow School to renew its commitment to cultural policy while focusing more specifically on issues impacting cities around the world. And it will provide new policy and analytical opportunities for students and faculty to complement the work of the Place Lab. I'd like to say a few words of thanks to everybody who made this wonderful project possible. I first want to thank all the many people that worked together over the last weeks, sometimes very long hours, to get us to this day to day, and I'd like to share a round of applause with them. There are too many to mention by name, but you know who you are. Thank you. And, uh, and one, more, one more personal word also to Theaster. I think this whole thing started over breakfast uh, a wonderful breakfast about like uh, six months ago or something like that where we kind of cooked up this idea, no pun intended. <laughs> and uh, it, has been, it has been a wonderful, wonderful partnership. I, I'm, I'm honored to have to be the Harris School as part of this and I look forward to making this a reality in the months and years to come. Thank you. Today's announcement would never have been possible without the legacy of the Cultural Policy Center and for that I would like to recognize a very special supporter, Joan Harris. Many know her for her civic leadership and unparalleled contributions to the arts and as a dedicated supporter of the Joan W. and Irving B. Harris Theater for Music and Dance. For her many contributions, she received the 2013 National Medal of Arts from President Obama. Joan is also a tireless friend of Chicago Harris, including urging the creation of the, Chicago po of the Cultural Policy Center with her unwavering support the Cultural Policy Center has served the arts and culture since 1999 by researching critical cultural issues, facilitating interdisciplinary conversations, and educating a broad range of graduate students about policy issues around the arts. I would now like to invite Joan Harris to the stage to say a few words. Thank you, Daniel. I want to make a special thanks to Dean Deermeyer for convening not just this evening, but for bringing this program into a whole new light. I'm the voice of the past, and uh, what we're going to hear tonight is the voice of the future. Uh, this new iteration of cultural policy and the politics of place represents a big change and it resonates with me very powerfully and I'll 
tell you why. I have a, a particular uh, definition of what I think artists do and who they are. There are several kinds of artists. One very important function of what artists do is to define, recognize, and help us to see what's beautiful in life, what's ugly, what needs doing. Artists who create art essentially for the purpose of making more art. And that's a very important thing. There's another kind of artist, and I think of artists as makers, all kinds of artists, and those are the artists who make art to change the world. Theaster Gates is one such person. He and a number of other artists have led the way and shown us what can happen when artists look around the world and say, this is what we can make. This is what we can do to make the world a better place. Uh, parenthetically, I just want to mention that the other night, Dean Dermeyer and I attended a new opera about Milai, <coughs> about the Milai massacre. And it's very true for me that no television programs or books or reports could bring home the meaning of the Milai massacre in the way that an opera did, and where the music and the drama and the lighting and the stage direction told us something that's very, very true. So we have now this new cultural place which is going to take cultural policy to a new level. We started the program 1999 because I thought cultural policy was a really important subject and needed to be looked at, but it needed to be looked at in a place that exercised rigorous intellectual energy. And what better place could that be but the Harris School? And now we're taking this whole thing to a new level, and I can't think of a better way and a better place than to have this now be in the hands of an artist who is a maker, who is a thinker, who is a deep humanist. Theaster, you have a big job and a big responsibility to take this program into a new level, and I know you're going to do it. So tonight you're going to hear a little bit about what is going to happen. There's a very, very interesting panel that's going to be teach us all, tell us all what's going to happen. It's going to be led by Carol Coletta, who is with the, um, uh, she's been a director of Art Place, and she is going to introduce all of you to the speakers that like. Carol, would you come up with the other speakers on the panel and take us through this wonderful evening? Thanks. Let's we'll see. Thank you so much, Joan. Um, we do have a terrific panel of speakers who I know really require uh, no introduction. Daniel Deermeyer, you heard from earlier. Theaster Gates and his team at Place Lab. This is your, uh, this is your night. This is your news. It's exciting to uh, be here with you. And Michelle Boone, of course, who is the dynamic commissioner of cultural affairs and special events, and is just for the city of Chicago, and is just coming off the spectacular uh, architecture biennial. So um, we're we're. Glad to have all of you here uh, for this conversation to uh, help us understand what taking it to the next level, Joan, really means and the impact that that can have on Chicago, the arts, and I think the world. Um, Theaster, what does the merger mean for, for Place Lab? And particularly, again, I'd, I'd love to hear from your perspective sure. what taking it to the next level means. Sure. So. Um, for the last seven or eight years, uh, I've been doing a work 
and the work has been kind of thinking about uh, ways in which culture um, could have an impact. And I was thinking about it from a kind of bricks and mortar perspective and a programmatic perspective, that there were things that seemed to be needed on the ground and needed in my neighborhood, and I would just kind of work as much as I could uh, to do as much as I could. And that meant that we, we, we created some cool spaces. We've, we're doing some amazing things, both at the University of Chicago on the arts block and, and here in the, in the kind of you know, Grand Crossing South Shore area. But all the time, there were these other questions that remained kind of looming questions. Questions like, um, you know, uh, if you build these things, how will you sustain them? Um, uh, are you creating a situation where gentrification could easily usurp the good effort that you've made? Um, uh, how do you deepen the partnerships that you have so that the work that you've started in the event that you walk away, others can continue it? Um, uh, what's the relationship between governance and policy? And like, how do you, how do you not just scale it, which is the, the question that people ask a lot, but, but also, how do you kind of demonstrate that this thing is exportable and which parts are exportable and why? And so all of those things that were gaps, they did not, I didn't feel like I had to take all those questions on. Like, I'm doing the work. And so there was something about just kind of committing in the same way with art. I'm committed to the work and y'all can figure out what the policy is or y'all, but I think that that, that that no longer seems reasonable and that um, we've done enough that we've learned a lot of lessons that we had shared anecdotally, and we want to scale our ability to share that more. And so I think that, for me, the, the Place Lab piece, which was already an investment in how we think about the way places change and the way they could grow, that that is now kind of connecting with Harris that thinks about um, the possibility of um, uh, uh, in, a, in a, like Joan said, in a very rigorous way, um, how do we capture uh, the progress that's being made in a place? How do we think about the change that's happening? And so I think, for me, I get to um, accept that there are parts of this puzzle that I don't understand fully, and that if we continue to uh, commit to the work, that there's a whole team of people that are interested in the reflection part. And so we're trying to kind of connect the impact that we hope to be making through culture with people who are measuring impact so that we can then share that with the larger community. Mm -hmm. and, and when you talk about reflection, um, Michelle, I, I'm curious. I mean, you're the, you're the champion of Chicago's arts and culture ecosystem. And I'm, I'm curious how this, you know, how this reflection benefits the larger ecosystem and thinking about the role that the university and this new turn uh, for the Harris School in terms of cultural policy can, can take, will take, and how, that, how you imagine that affecting uh, what you're governing in, a, in effect or nurturing. It's all really exciting. Um, I'm really, uh, first off, appreciative of the opportunity to be a part of this conversation. I think it's a, um, a bold step in um, uh, the right direction to have a conversation open with the community from the education institutions and artists, government. <coughs> and I think this merger, um, really, you know, the Cultural Policy Center was about policy and research and exploring issues that were really important and, and necessary for us to do our work, but now this connection with, you know, not just the ASTA, but what it represents. Um, the policy in action is, I think, what this really represents. And so it's not just about work that sits on a shelf, but you have the actualization of some of these ideas that artists think about exploring, that communities are wrestling with to try and figure out, well, what is the role of arts in advancing our community or um, attracting additional resources to a neighborhood? Um, and so I think this marriage between the two is gonna be, I hope, um, an idea that I'd like to see replicated um, around the city and maybe inspire other higher ed institutions to think about uh, other unique ways that they can partner with artists in the communities that they're already in. And, and 
other schools are doing it. I think the work that places like Columbia College um, are doing with the arts for the South Loop or how UIC is thinking about the arts with activating uh, cultural spaces for the West Side. Like this is a story that I think can be shared citywide and hopefully broadly replicated. You talk about policy in action, Michelle. I'm curious, are there a couple of questions that if you had persuasive answers to out of out I of this work? I have no work? persuasive answers to anything. Oh, well, <laughs> well I, I'm giving you. I just have a lot of questions. Well, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm, giving you, I'm giving you this opportunity to put a couple of questions out there that the Harris School could attempt to answer hmm. with this work. Ooh, I'd like to think about that. Can I think about that and get back to you? You, you, you certainly can. Uh, that's a really good question. I think um, I'd like to go back to our cultural plan. Um, you know, our department uh, in tandem with the city at large did a cultural plan that was released in 2012. And while it's not necessarily a policy document, it's populated with lots of ideas about what people said they wanted to see happen with the arts in Chicago. And a lot of that was about having more access to the arts in their own neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And you know, when we look at kind of the four tenets of the cultural plan, two are places and policies. And there are lots of ideas that populate both of those areas. And so to, to think about what this new relationship means in this new direction for the Cultural Policy Center and how it can be a resource to actually realize um, a lot of the agenda items and, and hopes and aspirations of the cultural plan would be interesting to explore. Mm -hmm. Daniel, what, what does this merger mean uh, that you can do now that you couldn't do before? I think that's a, that's a great way to think about it. And whenever you have a merger, right, it only makes sense if you can do things now that you couldn't do by yourself before. Right. So um, when you look at the Harris School, I mean, we have this you know, 25 plus year tradition in rigorous policies analysis, uh, you know, we, are, we are doing this in a whole variety of different areas. Um, we're well known for that. Um, we're educating the next generation of policy makers um, in this strong tradition. It's analytical, it's evidence-based, it's, it's unbiased. It's uh, maybe on an evening like today to say not really driven by ideology, just thought I'd add that. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, but, and, and, and that's great. And I think what we can do is we can bring this to the, the area of creative placemaking, to the arts, and we're excited about that. And I think an important part of that is that um, you know, we want to bring students, faculty, researchers that may not have thought that this is something interesting to them and bring them into the fold. That's, I think, that's, what, that's an important piece of what we're excited about. But I think there's another dimension to this. And the other dimension is really an evolution of what policy schools are and how we think about education and next generation of policy leaders. And I, would, I would claim that you know, a lot of innovation really goes on at the intersection of different areas where these touch, where things are not well defined, where they're fluid, um, where you kind of, you know, where you have some, some, some friction, where you have some creative tension. And what we see more and more is that the really tough problems, the really tough policy problems that we're dealing with, not just in cultural policy, but in any area, they're not well defined, they require creative thinking, they require thinking about it in a different way. So we see this in, 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 you know, in other areas such as engineering, where you know, engineers now think about design, they think about you know, visual aspects, they're trying to bring together these two dimensions. And so something that I'm hoping for us at the Harris School is that the influence and the impact that comes from this collaboration isn't just limited to cultural policy or creative placemaking, but can really have an impact of how we think about finding great policy solutions in any areas that we we'll work with. So to me, this is kind of like a left brain, right brain kind of thing, you know, mm -hmm. which is an analogy, but I think it's an appropriate analogy because I think the really tough policy challenges that the next generation of policy makers will face require a different, a, a different way to think about what solutions are, how to think about problems, and I think this merger will open up new possibilities to think about these areas more generally. Yeah. What does that look like uh, on a day-to-day -day basis for you? I mean, trying to, trying to make those intersections happen. Yeah. So I think the, the, what, 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 what we want to do, and that's our commitment to Theaster and, 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 and his team, is we want to support 
the many wonderful projects that they're engaged in. And we want to bring the kind of analytical capacity and way of thinking you know, that, we, that we stand for, that we do, and allow them to bring this dimension to the type of work that they've been doing. And you know, uh, wasn't there, uh, was that something that we all think we need, but it's difficult to do in isolation. Mm -hmm. So we're bringing these two pieces together so that the, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. Yeah. Specifically, the challenge will be, and we have some models on that, is how do you really, how do you really engage our, our students, our faculty on project-specific work so that it's real, that it's exciting, that it's engaging. And um, we have some models for that. One of the things that we started just like um, earlier this year is uh, we created um, these, uh, these policy labs, which, were, which, are, which involve students, they involve faculty, and they work with key institutions in the city in order to deal with real problems that the city and the state has. Um, we have, our, uh, we, have, uh, we have an existing um, project with the city of Gary, Indiana, which was one of the first ways where really we started working together with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the Aster on a specific thing. And I want particular thank you to Mayor Freeman over here joining us today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Yeah, there you go. And, uh, And I think the key is what you, what you need to do. How do you leverage, how do you utilize what universities are great at, which is research and education for social impact? And we have models, we have ideas of how to do this. Now we have the opportunity to broaden them and bring more talent, different ideas into this exciting area. Mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, when you talk about operating at the intersection and that's where innovation comes from, I think the Aster, you know, as someone who, um, representing Knight Foundation has funded your work. I know it's, it's always difficult to describe because you operate at the confluence of uh, fields that traditionally are uh, governed, if you will, are operated by expert specialists. Mm -hmm. And yet you're operating as artist, musician, mm -hmm. uh, actor, uh, yeah. community developer, social practice, yeah. jobs developer, and God knows what else. Um, I, I'm curious, what issues does that raise? Um, trying to operate, you know, across disciplines, what issues does that raise for you in your work? And also, what questions does it raise? What issues does it raise for the communities in which you work? Sure. So. Seven questions. That's seven questions, Carol. Seven. Was that seven? Seven questions. It was. So, it was two. Okay. So, so, so within your questions, um, I, I'm an artist. You know, I don't think about all the different parts so much. I think there's a set of things that I want to do, and I can either do them or not. Like I, I either have the ability to get them done or not. And then there are things that I believe in, and those things that I believe in, I either have the capacity to do those things or not. And so I try as best I can to try to work toward the things I believe in. Right? So I think that on one level, um, once I decided that my block was important, my block created some automatic problems, right? Some, some, some opportunities, some challenges, right? And one of those challenges, let's say, was vacancy. One was violence. One was a lack of cultural amenities. One was that there was one kind of building type, which was a, the residential two flat or the single story bungalow, in the absence of other kinds of building types that have been torn down, like other commercial, industrial, right? And so there were these things that we wanted to do, but we had these, these limitations. So it was like, all right, well, how do, we, how do we deal with these limitations? And I think that in, in the way that Dan's talking about, um, what seemed like a limitation, just, just it was the right kind of problem to just kind of dig into. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, well, you know, we do have these abandoned residential buildings. Could we do anything else with them? And you make that a, a question, and then you just dig into that question, right? And so when um, our new commissioner of planning came by the block, and we were explaining, hey, you know, here's the situation, here's the lay of the land. There's an appetite for culture, but there's no space to house it. But there are abandoned buildings. And it's like, all right, so how do you solve that problem? And one would need to be uh, an urban planner, an artist, a cook, a chef, a musician, a, an activist, a convener, in order to, right? 
but no one person is that, right? And so the only people that have the capacity to innovate in these gray and loose areas are like the corporate market, for whom their innovation is because they're like about to make some cash. So it's like, oh, this gray area that we don't know how to solve, mm -hmm. we can solve it. Like, oh, that's called a new rail system, and we're going to build it, and that's going to do X, Y, and Z, right? And I think that uh, one of the challenges that, that we're faced with is that given the lack of resources that exist in poor neighborhoods, there's not the, um, there's not the aggregated commitment by the necessary players in order to enact the kind of change that we want to see. And so anybody that would have the skill set that has the capacity to do these things, they'd be doing it in Fulton Market. They'd be like, oh, I could build an eight-story this, and I could have a hotel, I can do it this. Why would we waste our time in a place that doesn't guarantee a particular kind of yield? And so I think that part of, part of the challenge is what kind of makeup is necessary mm -hmm. in order for a neighborhood to become a, a sustained place? And then um, uh, who's asking and who's buying and who's participating? And I think that those have been the kinds of questions that, that I've been asking myself, right? So, so that one of the things that, that I hope the Place Lab will do um, in partnership with the, the Harris School is instead of just being a reflective tool like uh, art happens and then people look at it and they say, oh, that's what happened. That in fact, we have questions of like, how do you incentivize equitable redevelopment in a place um, where developers feel like they can um, uh, make, make new spaces happen and those things could happen if they need to happen affordably or in a mixed way? Or how do you both think about in, uh, in a cultural anchor that may not produce wealth in a place or may not generate funds in relationship to the aggregated possibility uh, in a place. And so I, my hope is that then the, the Harris School could start to be an innovator with us and then go back to the Department of Planning and say, you know, we have these, these four ideas for these seven neighborhoods around the city and they have to do with the creation of a cultural district or they have to do with with reimagining building codes that would allow for new uses when they didn't in the past. And that, and that, um, that work is a work that means that there has to be like a deep partnership between uh, what would traditionally be uh, an amazing zoning law firm with a private developer. Is there another model where folk who are um, the emergent force that live in a neighborhood be, would be willing to take on some of those tasks? talk to a professional body that can then get that same desire um, to the Department of Planning. And I think, I think that we can do that with some of these really amazing young people that, that are hungry to crunch numbers, hungry to talk about um, uh, the impact that is possible in a place. And so I think that we have enough big problems to, to make the number crunching uh, really exciting. You use the term uh, equitable development, and I know you've used the uh, You've talked about ethical redevelopment, redevelopment sure. right? Um, so when you use that term ethical redevelopment, what, what does that conjure up for you in terms of uh, difference? Yeah. What does that look like versus yeah. what we have today? So maybe that's to your, the second part of your question, which was Thank two you. questions. <laughs> uh, that, that on one level, you know, I grappled with this word ethical because in some ways when you look at the definition, it has to do with something moral but there's a way in which it also deals with the idea of um, equity and, and equality or opportunity for, you know, in my case, lots of different kinds of people. So I think that in, 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 in a way, ethical redevelopment means that we're willing to apply the tools and skills and resources in people who are normally creating development opportunities over there, we're able to use those tools over here and that the same kind of rigor that would help us build a Maggie Daly Park or a Millennium Park would be available to build a, a you know, Dorchester Park. And that, and that if the same kind of rigor and resources were made available, then we would be responding to the cultural plan and understanding that like all neighborhoods have the right to have access to beautiful parks and amazing culture and amazing teachers. We just gotta figure out how to do that. And I think this is, kind of where the rubber, one way of the rubber meeting the road.
Mm-hmm. Michelle, when you, um, when you think about the city's response or the, the, the city's desire to encourage this kind of development, it, it seems to call for some sort of mashup across departments, and that's never easy, I would think, for City Hall. Um, I mean, is there a, I mean, do you see a, a, a path for the city to organize in a different way to respond to this sort of mashup that they're talking about? I do. I think, at least it's been my experience in this administration, that there is a willingness to um, cross sectors and think about communities and neighborhood development in a more holistic way. In fact, um, my colleague, Commissioner Reefman is here and his planning department has a very um, ambitious plan in thinking about neighborhoods. And I think our department is working with planning um, in a way that didn't exist before, but mm-hmm. we're also working with CDOT and health and public transportation. And so it's not, um, Oh yeah, and by the way, we need some arts to happen over here. Yeah. Um, but I'm also really, um, I guess, sensitive to the enormous weight sometimes that the arts or artists have put on them mm-hmm. and the responsibility of being the driver for transforming, whatever that <laughs> means, a neighborhood or a community. And so, you know, I've had conversations with the Astor about Okay, so now the Stony Island um, Arts Bank building is open. Do we allow the measurement of success to be gauged by how many Starbucks, what hotel, what other kind of private developers uh, invest in this neighborhood without the consideration of, well, what do they want, right? How does Grand Crossing define what's a healthy, holistic neighborhood for them? And it's not a replication of Fulton Market or Logan Square, that there are unique qualities um, specific to this neighborhood as they are for each and every one of the 77 across Chicago. And so how do we make sure that the arts are a part of the answer, but not the only um, piece of the equation? Mm-hmm. And so how, how are you responding to that? You say 77 neighborhoods and they all want, right. you know, we, want We have a seat at ex- the table. We asked to be there. I think that was the beauty of um, the cultural plan, the and plan. I hate to keep referencing it, but it really was a powerful tool for signaling to my colleagues uh, in education and planning and transportation that, listen, people really want this. This isn't just our department talking about it. Um, I think, too, there had been a... a a long legacy of the department being a producer and not um, necessarily infiltrating into other um, agencies Mm -hmm. as a partner Mm -hmm. and working together to solve these really big questions. Um, Daniel, universities shape city and the neighborhoods that surround them. Um, The impact, economic, physical, intellectual, can be positive, it can also be contentious, and those things are not necessarily in opposition, right? Sometimes it may be a, you know, it's, it's on a, it's on a uh, could be timing. I, I'm curious how you think the university can be a leader in modeling the positive impact that universities can have on communities and specifically through this merger. So I think that this speaks really to <clears throat> I think a very important development that has been going on at the University of Chicago already over a few years. And I think this is a, this is an important next step in this, really in this evolution, which is that um, the, the university has been over the years and increasingly being really committed to be a positive force in the neighborhood and utilizing its specific strength for that. Yes, not everything we can do. There are certain things we can do. There are certain things we can't do. But the, the, I think the desire to be fully engaged, to be fully engaged mm-hmm. in a real way, not in some kind of, not in some kind of you know, um, superficial way, but in a way that's consistent with our values at the university, which means that we're going to look at the realities, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be driven by a sense of fearless inquiry, we're going to be driven by a desire to have impact, but by using what we're good at. And what we're good at is we're good at figuring out tough things and educating the next generation of people that know how to think about important problems. So what I love about this particular 
this particular initiative, it just puts these pieces together. Mm -hmm. It's a challenging problem, has all sorts of dimensions that we have to think about, from very practical to the political, to the question of, you know, of equity concerns, to the questions of like, uh, how do you scale this up, to the politics, all that is part of it. Mm -hmm. and, it and it allows us to use what we're, what we're best at, which is you know, how to think about it and how to bring young people um, that are being educated to be the next generation of leaders on this, bring to bear on these challenges in partnership with members of the community and with institutions um, such as this one and more broadly speaking, those that kind of really have an impact um, um, in the community. So for us in the Harris School, our desire is we want to be an anchor institution for the city and for the state. That means we want to be deeply involved with the specific challenges and then when we, when, we, when we do, and when we, when we learn something, then we want to be able to share it and connect it um, more broadly speaking. So for us, this is like, you know, this is re really ambitious, but I think that's the right way to think about it, is we're gonna, we're gonna use this as our place where we figure things out, where we make mm -hmm. progress. But we want to be in contact and we want to be in communication with what's going on in Brazil, and what's going on in Colombia, and what's going on in Cleveland, and what's going on across the world in other aspects, and create forums and convenings where this dialogue can occur. And the second thing to that, it's also important to us, I think, that we, that we learn how to take the lessons that have been developed here by Theaster and his team and by others, and help us educate and develop the next generation of leaders that can do this here, but also in other places as well. So I think there's an important challenge for us is how do we take the deep engagement that we, that, that we have here and connect it globally, to connect it with other cities in the United States, connect it with other neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and also to think about it from an educational point of view so that, the, that we are able to make a positive contribution um, for the development of, um, of innovators um, and leaders that can operate at the level of seriousness and the level of engagement um, all across the world. Do you worry about, as you think about scaling and, and learning lessons and having them applied elsewhere, do you worry about um, the ability to scale the imagination that this work has represented? Yes. I think that's, the hard, that's going to be the hardest problem. The hardest problem will be, it's not going to be, oh yeah, we have done this over here and there's you know, this infrastructure, but there's the zoning issues and this is how we fixed it. This is not about best practices. I think that's a, that's a terrible way to think about this. And it's not one size fits all. And it doesn't, yeah. it's one size yeah. fits all. What, right. the, you, the, way you, the way you formulate, I think it's exactly right. How do you, how do you, gener how do you create, educate, develop the next generation of leaders that can, that can you know, have that left brain, right brain approach to thinking about you know, creating, creating new solutions and be, and be really a positive forces of developing communities? And we have to think about how do we do this? So I think there's an important part here from the innovation point of view is like, what's, how, do, how do we innovate developing yeah. this? How do we do this? How do we design that? How do we come up with new models there? And the wonderful, I think, opportunity that we have is that we have this, we have the ability here to have people engaged in the work while they're developing their own capabilities and capacities. Mm -hmm. But to do this, I think, in a new, interesting, innovative way will be a challenge, and I think we're ready to tackle that, but I think that's what's, what, that's what's required eventually. I think that's what's exciting about the lab, right? It implies that it's a space for experimentation, and you try things. Um, you mix different components and pieces together to see what the outcome might be. Um, and so to have this kind of resource in the room to be able to try these kind of new things and new ideas, um, not just with the Astra, but beyond, and really explore what it means to have art and culture as a tool for social justice, equity, and a better um, city. Maybe, maybe this, is why, this is why I think the arts are so important, and why art, art is so important. That maybe you know, what we're calling innovation, I mean, this word, or, or laboratory practices, I think that that part of that is, you know, when you think about the kind of heart of artistic practice, it has to do with the ability to conjure, it, the ability to, to, to see when no one else sees a thing, and to kind of develop a muscle for seeing, 
And I think that artists do that in a lot of different ways. And, and, and this is like not my hokey art conversation, but it's really about, you know. What is hokey art? Like hokey, like um, <laughs> I don't want to be a bandage to a city's mm, problem, mm. hokey. Like let's just throw a mural on it and right. get some people together and we only have to spend $30,000 instead of the $5 million necessary to like tear the thing down and rebuild it, hokey. But there's a way in which an artist who's willing to take a real problem in the world or in their studio and turn the problem around long enough that it's like that new forms start to emerge, mm -hmm. that, a, that a kind of new way out of an artistic problem starts to emerge and that, and that you're at the same time concerned about uh, structure and, and visuality and causality and affect and politics and your personal belief, all of that stuff wrapped up in a painting, mm -hmm. let's say. Mm -hmm. Let's say we're talking about painting. But if you were to take that same uh, rigorous mm -hmm. engagement that happens mm -hmm. in the studio, and then if an artist also had a sense of how a city works, then they could essentially turn the problem of the city over and over and over in a way that a person who was trained to do policy alone couldn't, or governance alone mm -hmm. couldn't, or d traditional development. So, I mean, I'm ex I mean, it's how great. Like, I feel like Jay-Z, you guys are in my house. This is like amazing, you know? Like, there's this way in which, I mean, people told me over and over that the, the rehab of the bank was an impossible thing, and that we know that there were 17 developers that tried to do the bank before me, and all of my friends told me that it was stupid to do it. Not all of them. Not all of them. <laughs> not, 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 not all of them. I'm lying. You know, but, but, right? but when I think, you know, when I think about King, when I think about um, um, the Manilos, when I think about uh, folk who have, have been successful in um, making things happen in the city, who are not artists, their success as um, business people had to do also with their ability to turn a thing over and over and over again until whatever would have been the traditional um, model of, well, if we run the numbers, this doesn't work. Mm -hmm. If we run the numbers, this doesn't work. It's like, well, how do you get to a point where it's not really just about, mod about numbers? That maybe if you turn it over, there's another set of outcomes that work mm -hmm. that may in the future produce um, uh, the affect that would allow for sustainability. But it's like, you know, I, th I think that what I'm interested in, what I'm interested in in the Policy Center is that I would try to uh, encourage students who are already really good at the analytical to kind of think in new ways yes. about how to, how to form the problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Like, how do you turn the problem around long enough so that there's not one policy solution mm -hmm. and that the policy solution that you give isn't just the most fiscally efficient one, but that like the, the fiscally efficient policy solution may not always be advantageous for the community that you're in. And so are we willing to make a more complicated uh, problem mm -hmm. uh, that, that policy, future policymakers could, could grapple with and hopefully change our cities for the better. Yeah. Well, you're, uh, we need to wrap up. Uh, so was that the sign? We need to wrap up? <laughs> OK, thank you. Oh, oh we're doing Q&A? Cool. No one told me. Great. All right. Well, uh, are there questions? And we have a mic. Any questions? Just uh, stand up. There's a, there's a question. Is there one over here? There's also one over here. Is this when you next? Well, first, first of all, I admire the excellent work you've been doing Thank you. in the neighborhood. Thank you. But um, the, the challenge seems to be one of the distribution of human resources. Like you're there, you're pioneering, you're dedicated. Um, there are very wealthy suburbs that have well-educated people very high level of education, and their resources are beyond, are greater, much greater than the problems they have in their neighborhoods. <laughs> and what you want to do is link those resources with the needs, and the question is, how do you get the troops on the ground? How do you get people dedicated to be in a neighborhood and to go through this process 
that takes time. Yes. If you want to, if it really is to be indigenous. Yeah. And the second part of my concern is at what point do you attract the human resources and then say, uh oh, you're gentrifying. <laughs> Stop. Right. You know, it, it's this delicate balance and it also has a factor of time associated with it. Sure. Thanks so much. Uh, the first part of your question is exactly why this merger is important. That um, we realized that with all the work we wanted to do, um, having additional uh, folk who could think about the big problems was really important. And I, I gained 200 of them uh, a year. Uh, maybe some portion of that 200 as new uh, attendees uh, attend the Harris School. But we've also been trying to create a way to act as a magnet for folk that are interested in thinking about these same issues of um, ur urbanism, ethical redevelopment, cultural redevelopment. And so, and so we're trying to figure out, okay, what is the apparatus necessary to kind of think about the big ideas and the big problems of our cities while at the same time creating a platform where folk who have extra headspace and, and other kinds of capacities would be willing to kind of match, be a partner with us. So we're, we're thinking about that. As we think about that, we understand that um, in order for a struggling neighborhood to change, it requires resources and new people um, if we're going to ever get 100% uh, occupancy uh, in Grand Crossing, it means that somebody has to be willing to move here and others have to be willing to stay here. But your question is, does, does um, the reinvestment uh, of resources or the, the advent of a, a, a new, new big institutions in a neighborhood, does that automatically create a kind of laissez-faire, business as usual, and if it does and the market takes over, then what are the necessary tools to complement normal market, acti market activity, which kind of needs to happen in order to make a place work? And so that question is uh, the most exciting one because it requires that there is um, some pre-assumption that things are going to get better. And that then, based on the fact that things are going to get better, we could say there are uh, 7,500 units of housing in this area. And we want to ensure that 25 units of housing are always available at an affordable rate or, or um, uh, at a low income rate, right? And so it's like, because we need, we need lots of different kinds of people in order to have like a really good party, right? And like, <laughs> it, like, I don't want like all the Highland Parkers at Starbucks, because that is a boring and litigious <laughs> cup of coffee. <laughs> right? right? And so it's like, well, how do I make sure there's some funk at Starbucks? I want to keep the funk. <clears throat> and so that's what I tell myself every day, just like, how do you keep the funk? How do you keep the funk? And so we're thinking about strategies that include the creation of um, you know, cultural land trusts, Using, using the idea of the land trust as a model or a real estate investment trust that has a mission toward ensuring that there's affordability. But I think that's what you were getting at earlier in saying that to use the lab as a vehicle for tapping into these other departments within the university yes. that can tackle some of these broader questions. Mm -hmm. other question? uh, there was a question, Who, who's got the mic? Right there. Um, I have okay. It. Good evening, uh, my name is Claudia Figueroa. I'm a second year Master of Public Policy student. Um, <coughs> so my question is mainly for Dean Diermeyer. Um, which are the opportunities for students uh, in terms of taking advantage of this partnership? Uh, would it be like a fifth policy lab? If yes, would it be like in the current academic year or the next one? And also, uh, I know it's, it's a challenge. Um, and also, um, would this be open for students that are not from the Harris School, made for the humanities, for example? Thanks. Wow. So, uh, so the, the, way this, the way we're thinking about this is there's going to be a, um, a specific, um, you know, kind of very structured way of which we're going to work together. That's going to be one of the labs. That's the idea. 
And then what we're, what we're thinking about right now, and we're really in the process of planning this out, we want to have informal opportunities for engagement as well. And so this is particularly important for our second year students who are graduating, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, hopefully this June. So we already, had, we already have started some conversations on that to provide opportunities for that. There could also be things that go on during the summer. Uh, there could be things that are you know, individually project-based. Uh, this is things that we're, 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 we're going to be much more fluid. They're going to be much more project-specific. But um, our fantastically efficient and hardworking transition team um, is already kind of looking into some specific um, opportunities that can be engaged much earlier before we have the formal structures in place. Can I ask a question? No. Um, since she opened the door about students, um, and you may already do this, I don't know, but is there any thought about connecting with or working in some way with um, high school students? Um, it seems to me you said a lot about uh, future leaders. And so connecting with students that are already within the university system, they've kind of made a choice to be there. Um, but the idea of introducing policy as a career track um, or exposing this to high school students seems to me to be really important if you are about cultivating future leaders. So just curious. OK, so we have global engagement. We have other cities. We have undergraduates. We have high schoolers now. We'll, we'll, we'll get this done by Sunday. That's the plan. So, uh, <laughs> no, I love that. I love the idea. I just like no, no, I'm, yeah. I'm being prestigious here. But I think that what we have to be careful about. So I love the idea of doing this. The important thing for us, and we've learned this in a whole bunch of whole bunch of other initiatives, including these policy labs. It's really important for us to get the platform right, the model of engagement. If it's just kind of be driven by enthusiasm. That, la that kind of lasts three weeks, and then people yeah. have to go back to their day job. So I love this idea, but what, the way we need to be thinking about this then, who is our partner? Are there schools we want to engage with? Who do we do this? How do we work with? How do we deal the whole thing? So there is there's just a whole bunch of specific operational questions that need to be figured out to make these things successful. But once you got it, and once you have these kind of structures in place, then then these things can become sustainable and really, really kind of impressive. It's impressive what you can do. So if we're going down that, that route and if, there, if, if, you know, if, we have, if we find the right partners to do this, I think there's plenty of opportunities here. But it has to be done in a way that's deliberate so that we, that we create the types of partnerships that really allow us to, to have a platform where we can advance the agenda of what we're trying to do and create more inclusion and engagement um, across, uh, you know, and whether it's students, um, or high school students, or the people that want to be engaged in this. Because the more, the more people are engaged and thinking about this, the better for us, but it's got to be done in a way that is, that is structured and deliberate, I think. That's the, that's the one caveat I think we always have to keep in mind. Well, you put it on the table. Uh, it's on the question table. here? Yes. Um, hi. Here I'm, and then here. I'm Dari Safavi, I'm a cultural commentator with WBEZ, the NPR station. And uh, if I may ask a tough question about potential areas of conflict, uh, Theaster, my perception of you is somebody with entrepreneurial zeal who really <coughs> wants to do, innovate and experiment. And you are strategically wedding yourself and your vision to an institution and at that, an academic institution with its own built-in risk aversion kinds of factors. Uh, have you thought about hypothetical scenarios as to when you are trying to run to the races with your vision and somebody in the academic institution with great analytics team, great, but they're really great at after the effect, after the breakthrough coming in and analyzing it, just like an entrepreneur being wedded to an accounting firm, you know, could be a great accounting firm, but that's not where you go. For, uh, for your fulfillment of your entrepreneurial vision. Have you thought about those scenarios and those potential areas of conflict? Yeah. Thanks so much. So um, maybe we should go out for dinner. <laughs> um, one of the things that I'm very excited about, and, and I'll, I'll answer that as I'm thinking about Daniel's response to high schoolers, that um, what Daniel uh, is getting 
is bigger than he knows. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know how, how big of a pain. <coughs> Story of my life. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but, but through arts and public life, let's say the, the work that I'm doing at the University of Chicago when I'm not teaching, it is already a kind of a fully matured community arts engine that has as part of it about 40 high school students that are already involved in the question of art administration and art creation. And so it'll be very easy within the structure of arts and public life to then ask students uh, from the Harris School, hey, can you be more deeply engaged in their lives so that they might even imagine uh, not just artistic practice, but art artistic ad administration and cultural policy as potential futures. There's that part. One of the other things is, uh, like say, uh, weddings, like how one weds themselves. Uh, I often talk about kind of wearing three hats, that I'm the founder of a not-for-profit called Rebuild that manages cultural programming on the south side and kind of demonstrates and pilots that, that stuff out. And then I'm a, I'm a faculty member at the University of Chicago. Arts and Public Life is uh, this entity at the university that is deeply engaged in, in the work that I feel passionate about and the university has supported that. And then I'm, I'm an artist, you know, I'm, I'm an artist. And, and that triune of circumstance has allowed for us to invest about $45 million worth of resource on the south side in the last seven years. And I'm super excited about that. Now, now the aggregation of those resources couldn't have happened unless there was like vision and it's not just my vision, it was like all of us talking together with community members in Washington Park and community members in Jackson Park and asking the question, what could be there? But also there were moments where me as an artist said, I'm building a cafe. I wanna see a cafe, I wanna eat. And it's like, if nobody else eats at my cafe, I got a big kitchen, I could eat in my cafe, right? And I think that that, that combination of um, personal agency and, and social kind of interdependence has created a kind of a set of platforms that maybe include now some seven new cultural platforms that didn't exist two years ago. And so the wedding, while it's more complicated, and it means that I have to go to a lot of staff meetings, and, and I, you I meet those. with you Dan, I do love I staff know, meetings. And Dan and I, we meet at eight o'clock over you know, coffee. It's like I see him more than I see anybody in my personal life. <laughs> but in a way, it feels like this, this um, the city might call this a public-private partnership. Uh, others might think about the kind of inter-institutional partnerships that are possible. It's just my version of getting more done with more friends and more partners. And I think that right now it is a win, 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 more than it is a loss to me as a, as a, Can as a I, person. I, I want to add something to that. Just Thank you on so the, much. If I, if I may, Carol, like yes. just on the, you know, I think that, you know, if you really want, if you think about what universities do on a day-to-day -day basis and what the faculty does in their labs and in the classrooms and when they're writing papers there, I think they're, it's just, it's just fountains of innovation. It's yeah. new ideas and it's taking risks that we don't, we're not even imagining. And if you look back, you know, the breakthroughs that are happening, you know, whether it's in the medical school or, or in, in, in the humanities or whether it's happening in engineering or whatever the areas are. And the reason we can do that is because we are organized in a way where we can take risk and take, take chances that let's say a company or a government agencies can't do. Because that's what we're all about. We're all about figuring out the next thing that nobody has ever thought about. So as long as we're taking this capacity to create the next great insight, to prove the next great theorem, to develop the next great algorithm, to, you know, to do open heart surgery while the heart is still beating, whatever it is that we're doing, and leverage it and bring it to bear on society's most important challenges, whether that's right in our neighborhood or whether it is you know, what's another type of policy challenges, then we're really, I think, we're fulfilling our responsibility as a university for impact. But, the, but, the, but you got it already, the engine is there. It's happening every day, it's happening with the students, it's happening with the faculty. What we need to do is take that engine and bring it to bear on the challenges we have in our neighborhoods and worldwide. That's, that's the key. 
And I think that you know, what, uh, what, what, this, what this venture is all about is to take a bold attempt to try to make this work. Will it work? Right? Yes. Will it be successful? <laughs> absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Right? absolutely. <laughs> Hell yeah. All right, we have one more question, one last question. I don't know if this mic, yes, it's on. It is. Hi, I'm, my, my name is Marguerite Mariamma Moore, and I am a, an arts educator. I've worked in uh, New York and Chicago in the school systems in both places, and I've worked primarily with urban students uh, and their families as well. And I'm wondering, what strategies you have in place for engaging not only the students, you mentioned that, but also their parents, uh, the community residents in this conversation, because they're really essential in, in moving this forward and making a difference. Good, thanks. Thank you. So, so uh, I, I think in a way it's back to your question. In a way, uh, I have a good job at the University of Chicago. Isn't that enough, right? But when I think about my good job at the University of Chicago, it's reasonable to say that the university can do everything. Right? There's this moment where at the, that there's a kind of mission creep that kind of creeps beyond the mission's uh, capacity, the university's capacity. And so it's like, well, what are the ways in which we can kind of take my passion, which is also my research, and extend the university's capacity to make great things happen in the community? And I think that, that uh, it became really clear that if we were going to make platforms for, let's say, in this case, students and their parents, that maybe uh, uh, the platforms on campus for doing that might be somewhat limited. So unless you're a student at the university, it may be difficult to have access to certain things. Right? So then, but in my research, could I ask the university another kind of question? That is, uh, if we're also deeply engaged with the community, then what, what's, the, um, what, what's the bandwidth by which I might extend my research beyond the campus boundaries? And then what kind of space would be necessary that um, I can do my scholarship and a, a young person and their parents might also be able to say, uh, watch the screening of the Black Panthers at Black Cinema House or look at the Johnson Publications collection upstairs, or um, have, have a way of having the quest their, their daily neighborhood questions answered by people who um, not only know about foreclosure and housing policy and the law, they're, they're on the block and, and can be present doing uh, 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 foreclosure clinics uh, on Dorchester. And in a way, one has to just think about the, the platforms and structures uh, n that are necessary through which there could be a meeting of, uh, say, in this case, university interest in, in this larger community interest. And I think that if uh, uh, th there are lots of people that are interested in that work, and it, and it plays out in lots of different ways. So I just feel fortunate that I've had the um, uh, the support and the flexibility both through Rebuild Foundation and the university to kind of ask the question, what does the platform look like? And, and how do we start to capture more people? And so the fact that we're having this merger conversation off campus is a big deal. And that like, you know, after this we're gonna party. And I don't know if this many white people have been on Stony Island in 40 years. And so for all, of, for all of these ways of imagining what's possible, sometimes one simply has to make the space where new things might happen. This is a historic night, uh, a historic announcement. Uh, thank you, Joan. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Theaster, for allowing us to be part of it. Uh, please help me thank our panelists.